Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Karen Carr. I just wanted to welcome you to our first week of our Bible class and our study in Proverbs. Uh, we, the wisdom literature is a, a fantastic uh, journey, and we're going to be focusing this semester on uh, part one of Proverbs, the wisdom of Proverbs, and uh, welcome, and we're going to have a fantastic time. A little bit of a newness in our the way that we're doing our class time this semester. Uh, I've never done pre-recorded um, videos for our class. I've always done them live, either in person or in Zoom. So we're going to see how this goes. I'm excited, and y'all can let me know if you hate it or if it works for your schedule. It's going to work for my schedule. So for the next two semesters anyway, for my Bible class, we're going to be trying it this way. So instead of just being bound to Thursday uh, evenings in the Bible class, you'll be able to access the link. Um, usually, you know, uh, by Thursday in the week, the, the link will be there, and it will take you to a, uh, to a uh, video on YouTube. And this is class one. Uh, this is week one. And so we just want to get started you know, in, in our workbook and talking about our class schedule and our scope and sequence and all the interesting things, the, the technology of it all and the, uh, the little bit of nitpicking details before we actually get into the, to the Word. We're going to have a lot of good opportunities to get into the Word. We're going to have a teaching lesson, lesson every, uh, for 14 lessons, and so it's going to be an exciting uh, invigorating time in the Word of God. And for those of you that are returning students, uh, uh, I hope you enjoy the new uh, format. And for you new students, I hope you do as well. Everyone welcome and hope you're ready to get dive back into the Word of God into a new school year, a new semester, a new Bible study, and just uh, a lot of new. And I, I know we don't like new, but we're going to enjoy this. So just welcome again. And I want to talk to you about one of the most important documents uh, that you will receive here at Southwest Georgia Theological Seminary, and that is the scope and sequence. And usually in the announcement section or general section, uh, at the top of every course that you will be in, there'll be a scope and sequence for your coursework. The scope and sequence works much like a syllabus um, would, uh, it, it covers the scope of what we'll be studying and the sequence in which we will be studying it. So first things first. And it's, and it's given to you by the weeks. And it's a snapshot view for the whole semester, kind of like your weekly block on Moodle is. You know, your weekly blocks for Moodle, they open up week by week. You can't go in there and look at the whole picture um, all at once. We don't give you that much information, but your scope and sequence will give you that much information. It'll tell you exactly what you will be studying each week, what the class lecture or the notes, class notes will be on, and it will tell you what your homework assignment is. So um, it, you'll enjoy it. It doesn't have the, the uh, video links on the scope and sequence, but they will be in the weekly block each week that will take you directly to the new uh, video lecture and although we are not having a live class I do expect you to listen to the lectures they're part of the work assignment and um, we will know whether or not you've accessed the link on uh, Moodle and I expect you to access the link on Moodle I'm investing and my time my energy my information the knowledge that God has given me and I want you to invest as well. And we're starting a new year, and our, our main theme throughout the school this semester, this year, is commitment. And uh, teachers are making a new commitment to, to be the best that we can be. I'm making a new commitment as an instructor and as the chancellor to get my job done in a more efficient, better way, and to study better and to be just better. And so we're asking our students as well, and all of our teachers, all of our staff, to commit. And it's, it's hard sometimes. Distance learning is difficult because if you don't commit, you'll, you can get very distracted. So commit 
your ways unto the Lord, and he will strengthen you. He'll direct your paths. And as the Lord has been dealing with me over the past week, the footsteps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And I thought, you know, that is very technical. It didn't say that the highway that you were on was ordered by the Lord or the uh, super train or plane or whatever was ordered by the Lord. The thing that can take you miles and miles and miles in a, in a very short time. He said the footsteps. <laughs> that was fascinating to me. I said, oh my goodness, Lord, that is so cool. Because footsteps is very personal. Footsteps is not large league steps. It's one step at a time. One step at a time. The footsteps, one step at a time, are ordered by the Lord. He really is involved. He really wants to be involved in our lives. And in so much that he said your footsteps are ordered. I like that. Not your car links, not the miles that you're logging in, but the footsteps. And so he's counting our steps, and they're ordered by the Lord. And I love that information. So as we've been ordered by the Lord, we want to get started. And again, with your scope and sequence, please download that. Uh, save it to your laptop or your tablet. Print it out. Put it in the back of your notebook. I like to put it in the on the front of our notebook. We have a our cover page. And uh, everybody should have a notebook. We have a cover page. And so on the back, I like to put my scope and sequence on the back. And that way it's, it's with my notebook. And I can find it. It fits right in there. There's nothing else there. It's a good spot for it. And so uh, just, just a little bit of encouragement. I also have dividers in my notebook to separate each, each lesson. It helps me turn there quicker, more efficiently. So your notebook did not come with dividers. We did not provide those for you, but you can purchase those at Walmart, or at Staples, at Office Max, on Amazon, I'm sure. So get you some dividers because there are 14 lessons. And it's just it's just a good idea to get your notebook organized. Take this time, and uh, while everything's still new, before you, you just get loaded loaded up with all your different coursework, and get your notebook set in order so that it's organized. Your information is easy to find, um, and and be sure to you utilize your notebook uh, with the tests that are in there. These are the exact tests that you will have on Moodle. Different format on Moodle, but the questions will be the same, and they'll be in the same order. So uh, you know, don't don't let the workbook throw you. If you want to work ahead in your workbook, that's perfectly fine. Just be sure to do not miss your deadlines for turning in your assignments because we have instituted a brand new policy and we are going to stick to it because we've had a lot of abuse with people not doing their homework on time and just expecting us to open this, open this, open this, open this. We're not going to be doing that. We understand that there's death at times. We understand that there are extreme circumstances at times. If your life, if you family, if you and your family are facing death, if you're facing extreme circumstances, we need to hear from you, not six weeks after the fact. We need to feel, hear from you that week, and uh, it's important. We need to be committed. If we, and when I talk about extreme circumstances, I'm talking about someone in your family is having chemotherapy treatments, and I would like you to consider where you're at in your commitments if that happens in your life. Don't play around with your seminary training. Don't play around with your family commitments, your church commitments. If you are in a position that you cannot complete your assignments, be gracious enough to say, this is a bad time for me, I'm gonna step back. I don't. We don't want anybody to quit, but sometimes we have to step back. Sometimes we have to say, not now. Sometimes we have to be gracious enough to the people that are actually working with us, to your instructors, to the staff, that this is a hardship for them as well. Now, we love what we're doing. I love what I'm doing, and I am committed to what I'm doing, and I want you to know that I am. But it's there's certain family members in my family that if during this semester they pass away, I'm going to call out and reach out for some help. 
Uh, I will have to adjust my schedule. I would have to make amends to what I regularly do each week. So you do the same thing. Try with everything that's in you to, uh, to meet the goals. Now, I will have, pay attention to what's going on in Moodle because it tells you when something is going to close. But here's, here's a formula. All of our assignments in every class, no matter which class you're in, is going to open on Fridays. Our classes start on the 17th of August, and um, the, everything will open up on the 18th, which is a Friday. Your uh, study guides will open at 8 o'clock in the morning, and the uh, homework quizzes will open up around noon on Fridays. Now, you've got all week long until the next Friday before it's actually due. And then you have two more days. You have Saturday and Sunday before it closes. So try to make sure that you have your homework done by Saturday morning and get, get, get it in, get it submitted. Uh, things are going to close on Sunday night around 11.45. Don't play around with that. Don't allow yourself to wait around till that late to be trying to do your assignments. Please make it a priority. Set yourself a schedule and stick to it. Get it, get it done in your workbook. By all means, get it done. Uh, if, you, if you're excited and read ahead and get a couple of quizzes done, that's fine. But be sure you're paying attention to the due dates and when things are closing because except it's extreme circumstances, we will not be opening, opening it again. And you will receive a zero. I don't want that to happen. And I, we want you to succeed. We want you to make it. This is, this is our mission. This is our life work, and uh, we want you to succeed. You succeeding is us succeeding. But commit. Make a commitment and stick with it, and let's get it done. So enough of all of that. We're going to start looking tonight at the wisdom of Proverbs. We're going to talk about the introduction, and um, we're going to talk about lesson one. Now here's another thing. In the workbook, there was no quiz at the end of Lesson 1. However, on Moodle, there will be a quiz for Lesson 1. And there's a, there'll be a study guide that will open up on the 18th. Uh, you will be able to access that study guide. It's just 10 questions. It's not difficult. It's not hard. It's all information contained in the introduction and the first lesson on Solomon. So just remember that. You will have that. Uh, quiz to complete as well and the rest of them are all in your notebook they're already there and so just pay attention to due dates and we're going to have a great semester so as we look at proverbs and as i mentioned earlier this uh this semester is considered proverbs part one because proverbs is a very large book so we're dividing it up into two semesters and we'll have the second part when we come back after christmas and uh, for the spring semester. So we're going to be eating these good things in Proverbs. And as our, our um, workbook opens up, and after you, you know, get past the uh, outline uh, and the unit introduction, and it starts a question that says, why Proverbs? So why study Proverbs? Much like we asked the question, why study doctrines? Because uh, some people have an aversion when you use the word doctrine, they get their shield comes up, they start getting offensive, and they 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 fear that you're going to indoctrinate them, perhaps in something that's contrary to their church beliefs or their uh, their faith beliefs or their denomination. Uh, that's not what doctrine means. Uh, biblically, the word doctrine means teaching, and uh, we're to be skilled in doctrine. We we. Doctrine is, is the study of a specific teaching found within the Bible. Now, a lot of church, church churches and church organizations and denominations, they have a lot of dogmas and doctrines within their church that they, uh, that they ask their membership, you know, to comply with. And that's not the kind of doctrine that we're talking about. We're, we're basically talking about the teachings and the mandates and the instructions that's found in the Bible. And as we look at Proverbs, I guess the most famous, one of the most famous verses concerning Proverbs and the wisdom of Proverbs is found in Proverbs 1, verse 7. And it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. 
but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What a mouthful that is, and in the course of my life, I can say a big, hearty amen. Uh, the fear of the Lord will start your journey into knowledge, the knowledge of the Lord, to wisdom, to instruction, to understanding, and all of the words that are referenced and allude to wisdom. And uh, on, on our workbook, I found a wonderful cover for our cover page, uh, and it says The Way of Wisdom. And uh, there was a wonderful song that I heard years ago called We Choose the Way of the Lord. We Choose the Way of Wisdom. And I said, you know, that just speaks to my spirit, uh, the way of wisdom. Now, our path, as we mentioned earlier, the footsteps of a righteous man, the footsteps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And, and all of us can agree that we have to work with the Lord, that we have to agree to walk in his precepts, in his judgments, in his commandments, in his statutes. It's one of the reasons I'm going to go out of text just a little bit and, and, and reference Psalm 119. There are basically 10 words in Psalm 119 that's used throughout that long chapter that, that is a reference, a point blank reference to the word of God. Words that's used, and I've taught this before, words that's used like commandment and the law and covenant and testimonies and um, precepts and statues and judgments and, and instructions. And there's 10 words that's used. And they're used in every verse within Psalms 119, except one verse. They're used sporadically throughout, uh, interchangeably. Some verses say the law. Some say the covenants. Some say the testimonies. Some say the precepts, the judgments, the statues uh, of the Lord. So we, uh, it all kind of means, has a meaning of the, the same connotation when we say the word of God. It will, and the word itself is used as one of the ten words. Proverbs is like that because Proverbs uses words that are meaty and powerful, uh, that is tied like to wisdom. Uh, it's much like I see a wheel, and in the middle of the wheel there is a, a there are there's a hub that the all the spokes. All, they, they join together right there in the center and they're connected and they cause the wheel to be stable and cause the wheel to turn, cause the wheel to go round and round. And without it, you wouldn't have a stable wheel. You wouldn't have a good structure. And it, it, it's all part of the structure of the wheel. And I feel that way about wisdom. These words that's used, although there are different Hebrew words that's used in the book of Proverbs that, uh, that are words like uh, discretion, and instruction, and understanding, and wisdom, and wise sayings, and uh, they they allude to that mystery of wisdom, and and we're going to get into the study of the words uh, later in uh, the semester. Perhaps I think it's the second week, but here today, the first week, we we just remind ourselves of why we're studying Proverbs and what it all means to us. And Second uh, Timothy three sixteen. Uh, says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Wonderful, powerful verse. The uh, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, a lot of times artists claim to be inspired. Musicians can be inspired. Painters can be inspired. Sculptors and actors and actresses and all manner of art forms can uh, claim inspiration, but those are that's a natural inspiration. And although it may be very tied to our soul and to the creative process within us as human beings, um, that's another subject that I love to get on, the fact that we're made in the image of God and, and we love to create things. People, people like to cook, they like to bake, they like to make music, they like to sing, they like to dance, and they like to feel inspired. And uh, we're, we're actually walking in the image of God when we feel creative. So go be creative. But, uh, there's a, but so when it said that, that scripture is given by the inspiration of God, that word inspiration there used in the Greek means God breathed. 
that, that all scripture is given by the breath of God. That is just marvelous. I can just sit back and just chew on that for the rest of the day. But So what do we think when we think that something is God-breathed? That's divinely inspired. It's different than any other kind of inspiration that we can speak of. Something that is the very breath of God. So scripture, all scripture is given by the inspiration, by the breath of God. And Paul told Timothy that it's profitable. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so that is why we're going to study Proverbs is because we feel that Proverbs is divinely inspired. And it uh, so all the believers, we have to believe that all the books that's included in the scripture by God's design are there for our benefit, for uh, doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You know, the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So we, we embrace Proverbs as a part of the divine inspiration of God and specifically divine wisdom. So embrace Proverbs, embrace the study. It's, uh, it's not like any other book uh, actually in the Bible because a lot of the books within the Bible, especially the Old Testament, even the Gospels and, and the Epistles and all there, there's a lot of focus around the individual that's either portrayed, talked about, uh, or we learn about within the pages of the Bible stories. Uh, as individuals, their stories come to life and we focus on, on the individuals like Moses and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the patriarchs and, and Joshua and the judges and, and the prophets and how uh, Elijah, how exciting that is. Proverbs is not about an individual. Proverbs is not about uh, individual prophecies or foretelling like Daniel or the book of Revelation. They're, they're, they're about prophecy and foretelling. A lot of the prophets were speaking divine utterances about the coming of Messiah. And there's things yet to be fulfilled that we know that will happen at God's appointed time. But Proverbs is not like that. Proverbs does not center itself around an individual personality. Very unique. But one of the things that Proverbs is useful for is the fact that it, it can be used and viewed as a world view. Now, some of you are have progressed uh, beyond the bachelor's program. So you, if you have, you have taken our course, uh, The Truth About Worldviews. And that course focuses on uh, religions, world religions, and the various religions like Hinduism and Islam and um, Shintoism, Buddhism, uh, Judaism, denominationally wise Catholicism and Christianity on different various levels. And so we look at the worldview that is viewed within the lens of those belief systems. But there's also economic worldviews. We have a, a capital, capitalistic worldview. We have communistic worldviews uh, that, that look at economic virtues or fail, failures. And they base their worldview on an economic structure. And, but there is a lot of belief system-based worldviews. And, and some is the fact that people do believe in God and are believing gods and, and a panthe, uh, pantheon of gods. And they, they believe some are monotheistic. And so it's, you can find a lot of different worldviews when you want to talk about theism or atheism, which means without God. And, and there's scientific approaches to look at uh, that explains people's worldview. They think that science and the scientific world in that realm will uh, define and shape and explain their worldview, including the view about God. So there's a lot to be said about different worldviews. But um, So there's countless others. So uh, the worldview in which we look through shapes our lives. It's going to shape our thinking. It's going to shape uh, how we live our life. If, and we as Christians have a panoramic worldview that is biblically based. It's, it's based on the scriptures. It's based on the lens of scriptures. When we look at describing, defining life, 
defining our morality or our ethics. It should be, and that's another course we have is uh, our ethics course, where we're not just controlled by the changing morals of our society, uh, we being a mess, but our morals and our lifestyle and our conversation, as Paul describes it in the New Testament, which means lifestyle. The Greek word for those words, conversation, in the New Testament means the lifestyle that we live. Uh, our, the lifestyle that we live is demonstrated a lot by what we say and obviously what we do. A lot of times what we say and what we do doesn't always line up. Our worldview needs to get straight. But if we truly and honestly look at our, our worldview as influence, it's Christian-based, Bible-based, we are Bible-believing Christians, and our worldview is shaped by the Scriptures. And so we're looking at Proverbs, and it's, it will help shape our worldview. The teachings that's in Proverbs, not alone, Proverbs alone is not uh, all that will shape us, but it is a very good book. It's a divine book filled with divine wisdom, filled with uh, good, clean living, if you will, because we, uh, when we think of divine wisdom being our worldview, wow. Job said that God said that when he created everything, wisdom was standing right there beside him. <laughs> that, so how could we not embrace wisdom? When you read the first nine chapters of Proverbs, it is actually a, 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 an argument, if you will, to the young, to a student, if you will, uh, to embrace wisdom, to uh, bind wisdom about their neck, write it on the table of their heart. Uh, so it, it definitely could be shaped up in our life as a worldview. Wisdom uh, can absolutely show the, the different viewpoints of human behavior. Uh, Proverbs often makes comparisons between those that's choosing righteous good paths to those that are choosing foolish, wicked paths. And the, the contrast in the result of the choices that people made is often seen within the book of Proverbs. And wisdom itself is said to, to stand and make a call to the young, to those who would receive instruction, to those who would embrace the teachings of wisdom to come. That she's built her house, she's hewn out her seven pillars, and that she's making a plea to the simple and to the young to come and to eat at her table versus... Uh, the foolish. Uh, it definitely will inspire wise, clean living. I love it. And, and it has it's filled with plenty of warnings. So uh, if, if you're the type of person that wants inspiration, if you're the type of person that needs some warnings that says, you know, you do better by, you better not do that. Well, Proverbs has got a, a lot of you better not do that. <laughs> so uh, we, can, we can use it for a great worldview. Uh, it's a unique book. Uh, it's organizing Proverbs into a cohesive study is a little difficult. Dif difficult. As I said, the first nine, ten chapters is, uh, is a plea speaking of the characteristics of wisdom, the characteristics of the strange woman, the characteristics of the foolish. Uh, and and then, then you get into those chapters really from chapter 10 to 29 that is a uh, Podge, a melting pot of, of witty sayings and wise counsel and sometimes it's not always just on a main theme like okay in this chapter we're going to talk about bad marriages we're going to talk about foolish financial decisions it doesn't do that in, interlaced throughout those chapters there there'll be verses uh, one and two and three at a time that that give you instruction about not being a borrower, and uh, that way you're not a servant to the lender, and, and just things that you can really take to heart, but it's, it's scattered, and so organize it, organizing it into our study has been a little bit challenging. It's challenging for most Bible scholars. It's a, Proverbs is not a book to be taken lightly. All of it is, is digestible. All of it is doable. And we hope that you enjoy the version of, of the organization, if you will, the verses and the chapters of Proverbs in it, and that it speaks into your life. So we, um, we feel like the authors of, of Proverbs are mentioned, definitely Solomon, 
in Proverbs chapters 1 through 29, it's clearly seen and stated. And we will definitely examine, uh, you know, him directly and, and more. Because the book says it's the Proverbs of Solomon. Uh, Agur is uh, said specifically within the Bible to be the author of Proverbs 30. Uh, and also Lemuel is, and his mother, the words of his mother that Lemuel penned there in Proverbs 31 about the virtuous woman and the beautiful parable that can anyone find a virtuous woman? And uh, the rarity and the, uh, the depth of who she is and what she is and many sermons, many teachings have come forth about the virtuous woman. Very hard standard to live up to. It takes the grace of God. And, and many times I'm like, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying, but it's so powerful. And also it speaks when you study about the virtuous woman in Proverbs. Um, periodically I have entertained the concept of using the Proverbs 31 woman as uh, the church or a church and the model of what a church should be. And uh, so look at it that way. We'll cover that, of course, when we get to Proverbs chapter 31, which is a next semester way off, but I'm excited and can't wait till we get there. So these, these three people are mentioned as authors of, of Proverbs, within the book of Proverbs. Some is said that all of these people are different names that refer to Solomon himself. Uh, we can't necessarily prove that. Uh, it is a proposition that we make that could be possible, and that when, in chapter 31, that when the mother of King Lemuel is actually speaking of King Solomon, and that his mother, of course, was Bathsheba. So the dates that are written around for Proverbs that we feel that are, some of them, the early ones, are around 950 B.C., and uh, that's, that's pretty good. Proverbs 30, you can't really date it with confidence. It's un, he's unknown. Uh, he's credited with as being the author of, of chapter 30, but as far as the date, it's hard to date. Proverbs uh, 31 uh, is, is also true, uh, trying to date those. So, But we know that Solomon's Proverbs, those that were attributed, that we really believe that we know for a fact were uh, authored by Solomon, was around 950 B.C. We also know that uh, some of the later ones, Proverbs 25 through 29, was probably around 700 B.C., uh, the work undertaken maybe during Hezekiah's reign. Uh, and so he's dated, you know, around 716 B.C., something like that. So that that's possible, that he pulled them together, that he found them, that he brought them back, that he kind of revived them and uh, put them in circulation again. And it's good thought. And we also know that there's about eight instances in the New Testament where Proverbs is referenced. That is in your workbook, those references, and that's a pretty good showing for a book to be backed up by the New Testament. Uh, when, uh, when a book, certain book, is, is backed up, if you will, by, uh, if it's in the Old Testament, it's backed up by the New Testament, whether Jesus reiterated or uh, quoted from uh, some of the Psalms, he quoted from Moses, he quoted from, uh, he talked about Solomon and Solomon's wisdom, he spoke of the prophet saying this, or Jeremiah said that, he was actually endorsing the words that they said. So the New Testament endorsed the book of Proverbs was that, those eight showing. So pay attention to that in your uh, in your uh, workbook and read those things. And if you're paying attention, uh, you know, we're, we're, we don't have a lot that we're going to say about Solomon, but we are definitely going to bring out some about Solomon during this, uh, this video lecture here. So pay attention in your workbook. Some of the great things you don't want to miss it. Don't overstep it. So now we're going to talk just for a minute, if you will, about Solomon himself. Jesus said that Solomon in all his glory went arrayed like the lilies of the field, or the flowers of the grass, that in all of his glory, in all his pomp, in all his circumstances, some of that glory that made the, king, the queen of Sheba faint <laughs> when she saw Solomon on his throne and saw the table of Solomon and his servants and the, uh, their attendants and the ministers and his ascent up into the house of God, said there was no more spirit within her. 
So it, it kind of gives a, she fainted. It said the half has, I heard about your wisdom. I heard about your splendor. I heard about all of this, but only half was told to me. I like that. The half has never yet been told. So we, we uh, but it's interesting that Solomon's name means peaceful. His name is tied to the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. And um, he's, it, it really was prophetic for his name to be peace. And I, I think also David and Bathsheba, his parents, probably longed for peace to come. Things had been in such turmoil. Solomon's birth, Solomon's family dynamics was in a mess. Matter of fact, it, it created such a mess within the kingdom, within the, the household of the king, that the prophet said to David, the sword will not leave your house. Because of your actions, because of your sin, because of what you did in trying to jump ahead of God and overrule God and not live your life according to God's ways, it brought trouble to everybody. It brought trouble to everybody. So probably at that time in their life, naming that little child peaceful, I believe they were longing for peace, the consolation to be consoled about the child that they lost and consoled about the, the dynamics within their own family, that they were longing and hoping that as the child's name was, so that he would be. And it's interesting to note that, Sa that Solomon did not go to warfare that he, uh, he had peace with his enemies all around him. Matter of fact, a lot of it that could have, people that, nations that could have and should have been his en enemies actually paid tribute to Solomon and paid, paid taxes to Solomon. And because Solomon's kingdom was a very opulent, expensive kingdom to maintain. And the enemies of Solomon paid the price. And the, the citizens of, of, uh, you know, Israel paid the price. You know, Solomon is, is living right in the middle of, of the United Kingdom. When the kingdom came together, you know, with uh, it went totally together with King Saul. It was semi-quasi together. But David brought uh, the ten northern tribes and those in Judah together. And for a, a, a long time during the reign of David, and uh, probably about... 33 years of David's reign was at peace with everybody at peace and bringing everybody into unity and bringing them together. And uh, Solomon got to live in that peaceful atmosphere. Wasn't that great? Wow. So David was, uh, you know, everybody's heard of David and Bathsheba. David was Solomon's father and Bathsheba was David's mother. And, uh, the Bible says that the Lord loved Solomon. Uh, in 2 Samuel 12, 24, it said the Lord loved Solomon. Dave, uh, Solomon was uh, Bathsheba's choice, of course. That's her son. And David had made a promise to Bathsheba at some point that our son, Solomon, will sit on the throne. And Solomon wasn't the firstborn. There were, there were others that had been born before Solomon. And uh, they were destined, uh, you know, according to tra traditions of that time, they should have been ones to sit on the throne. But because of the bad blood in, within the family and the, uh, the incest and the rape and the murders that went on among Solomon's brothers and the sister, that it caused such an upheaval and the rebellion of Absalom, and uh, they, they perished, they died. And Ammon, the very firstborn, was killed you know, by Absalom because of the rape of Tamar. And, uh, you know, Nathan said, the sword is not going to depart from your house. And so the, the fourth son of David, which was Adonijah, according to traditions, should have been made king. And everybody was pulling that way. And they, they tried to go through a coronation with... Uh, Abiathar the priest to uh, and Nathan went to David and said uh, it was my understanding that Bathsheba's son Solomon was going to sit on the throne they've made Adonijah the king and so David had to parade Solomon out there and say no he's king so he assumes the throne and arises to the throne and it was even at the choosing of God David wasn't the only one that chose Solomon God 
chose Solomon. Uh, there was something in Solomon that God loved. And when Solomon, he ended up ruling, you know, for 40 years. But he had his dreams when he was uh, in a high place and sacrificing sacrifices to God because the temple had not yet been built and the brazen altar was there. He had a dream there, and in that dream the Lord came to him. And uh, Solomon, you know, confessed to the Lord his, his youth and his inexperience and the worry that he would not have the wisdom that it would take to do the job that was before him, to lead God's people, to uh, his, God, so great God's people. So he asked the Lord to help me and give, give me wisdom. And that thing pleased God. He, he was very pleased with Solomon's request. And in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 10, it says the Lord was pleased because he asked for wisdom instead of asking for himself, long life, riches, and the lives of his enemies. And that is all found in 1 Kings 3, 11. So God was so pleased that not only did he give Solomon the wisdom that he asked for, but he also gave him long life and riches and the lives of his enemies and peace. So he told him, I love that. The scripture actually says that he gave him an understanding heart. I love that. An understanding heart. Now, in Solomon's personal life, we see in his judgments with the kingdom, in his dealings with uh, situations that's brought before him, uh, nothing could compare to the first bout of wisdom that Solomon displayed with the two women that brought the child. And uh, they lived in the house together, and one woman in her bed at night when they were newborns rolled on her child and smothered it, and it died. And when she woke up in the night and realized her child was dead, she switched babies with the other woman. And the, the other woman who had the, her child taken from her that was alive knew that the dead child was not her child. And, and you know, the, so the accusation was made that the living child is mine. And the, the rebuttal was, no, the dead child is yours, the living child is mine. So they brought this situation to Solomon. What do you do? Who's, who's the true mother? What, what kind of wisdom would it take? What kind of understanding would you have to have to make a decision on this? Because it's she said, she said, and based on all hearsay, there were no eyewitnesses to that except for the woman who was actually lying. And Solomon said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword, and uh, he said, we'll divide the child in half, and we'll give half to this woman and half to this woman. And, and the real mother could not stand that. Her heart was moved in total compassion. She said, don't divide the child. Don't kill the child. Don't separate the child. Give her the living child. Her heart, her mother heart was moved with such compassion. The woman who that wasn't her child said, yeah, let's divide it. She knew that wasn't her child. She didn't have the same love that the real mother had. What an outcome. What an outcome from wisdom. And I, I'm like, God, we need this wisdom. Your people need this wisdom today. We need this kind of understanding. No wonder Solomon said, you know, with all you're getting, uh, get understanding. Uh, which means no matter how much it costs you, whatever, what, whatever the price that you have to pay, you need wisdom and you need understanding and, and get it. Uh, and once you get it, tie it to you. And I said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, help us to get wisdom. And Lord, help us to get understanding. So uh, his wisdom was on full display in the, in the situation with those two women. Uh, of course, you know, the, the, the testimony of the Queen of Sheba that came to view the wisdom of Solomon uh, was the half has not been told. That you just had to see it to believe it. You just had to witness it in action. You had to witness his, you just had to witness his, the throne room. You had to witness the, uh, how his servants stood, uh, everything that was on display. And oh my goodness, once the house of God that was built. And, you know, it took seven years to build the temple. Of course, David laid up everything that was needed for Solomon to accomplish that job. David worked, you know, 20 years of his life just gathering what needed for the building of the temple. He wanted to build it so bad. And God said, You're, you'll not build it. Your son, your son will build it. 
and how wonderful it was. And just for this bit of information, it took four years to lay the foundation of Solomon's temple. Now, seven years in total to build the temple, four of it in laying the foundation. So how important is the foundation? I believe that what we do here at the seminary, I believe that what we do growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ is laying our foundation. Jesus spoke a parable and said that a wise man will build his house on a rock and the foolish will build his house on the sand. And he said, you're a wise man if you build your house on my word, but you're a foolish man if you build your house on anything but my word. All other ground, the hymn says, all other ground is sinking sand. We want to build on the rock. So Solomon building his temple on that solid foundation was wisdom, was absolute, total, complete wisdom. Uh, how important it is, lay your foundation. Lay your foundation. We'll speak of that in, in other chapters here in, in Proverbs uh, about wisdom building her house. And I love that. I Think about what Solomon learned about building and about the foundation of something being built. And, um, you know, we're speaking not just of buildings. We're not speaking of a building project. We're speaking about the fact that God is building a church and not a building. Uh, we're, we're part of the church. New Testament says we're living stones. We're lively stones. And we're, he's building us together to be a habitation of God through the Spirit. And uh, we're, we're, we're living stones. And Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And we're building our life on the Word of God. We're shaping our life to be influenced and our worldview to absolutely be, be unapologetically Christian and Bible-based. So lay your foundation. Uh, in the new converts that come within your churches, the, uh, the people that you minister to, the people that you win to the Lord, help them, to, help them build a foundation. Help them build a solid foundation in the Word of God. Help people learn to trust in the Word of God and believe in the Word of God and depend on the Word of God because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So love wisdom. Embrace wisdom. Uh, grab a hold of wisdom and don't let her go. So the wisdom of God, the wisdom God gave Solomon uh, helped him throughout his life. It will help you deal with leaders of other countries. Uh, it, it helped him... Uh, you know, build and oversee the, the, the building of the temple. Uh, also, the, it, it helped him oversee the building, the construction of his own house and other grand structures that was built throughout the kingdom. And it will also help you to gain respect of other rulers uh, that came to visit him and the, uh, those that ha admired him and had respect for him. It was because of his wisdom. It wasn't just because of the wealth that he had and the opulence that went on because that actually be became a little bit of a detriment to Solomon later on in his life and the influence of all those women, uh, foreign women, strange women. Uh, uh, was, it was a, a leaving almost of, of, of wisdom that he should have been embracing at that time. He exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and wisdom according to 1 Kings 10.23. Solomon's... Uh, Actions and wisdom are all written in the uh, book of the Acts of Kings, which is, I mean, the Acts of Solomon, which is 1 Kings um, 1141. Um, that book that says it was the Acts of Solomon is unknown to us or lost to us, but we do have Ecclesiastes and we do have the Song of Solomon that helps further the story and the wisdom of Solomon. So it, it's nice to have those things. So Solomon had some promises from God. And he walked, he did walk in those. And but God did warn him. And Solomon definitely had weaknesses. He was not perfect. And many of us have been gifted by God with many talents. Some people are very talented musicians, talented singers, talented preachers and orators, and gifted in so many ways. But we have to be very careful to, to not just rely on our gifts and our abilities, even that God has given us, but that our character and our ethical compass and even moral com compass that they line up with the word of God that we don't shift that we don't rely on what we've been gifted with that that's not our shoe in and of course uh, 
On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. So let's keep building our firm foundation on the solid rock, which is the word of God. Let's take to heart the wisdom of Proverbs. Let's listen to the wise sayings. Let's listen to the voice of understanding, of discretion, of wisdom. And let's apply this to our actions, our life, and our conversation. And uh, Solomon reigned for a very long time. And he uh, reigned and dispensed the wisdom that God gave him to a multitude, I'm sure, many people. Uh, but in the, in the sad ending of Solomon's life, we have to trust that in the end he cried out to God and repented to God and believed uh, in, in, in his covenant relationship with his God that wisdom brought him you know, back to the place that he needed to be and that he didn't let the strange women that he even warned about in the Proverbs to dictate his final moments or his eternity. Of course, those things we have to put in the hands of God because we don't know, uh, we're not sh assured of, of others. We have to put them in the hands of God and even our own soul and our own salvation. Amen. Us and the Lord uh, working all that out and walking in the grace of God and growing in the grace of God and standing firm in the grace of God. Paul said that's made us free and not being entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Uh, you know, the power of the resurrected Christ sets us free from the yoke of bondage and from the power of sin, and we can walk in the newness of life. And so we believe in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to help us, not just to uh, walk the straight and narrow pathway, but, but, but to walk it. We could not walk it without him. And, and though a good man fall, the Lord will uphold him. And uh, believe that your footsteps are ordered by the Lord. And that our study in Proverbs is going to lead you down a great path, making better decisions, making wiser decisions, uh, having w wise counselors around you, those that will help you make wise decisions and help you uh, not walk in anger or just lust or other negative emotions, but that the, that the Lord will help us to live a life of wisdom and sobriety soberness as he spoke you know throughout the word of god in the prophets and and in the the epistles of paul when he said you know for us to be sober-minded and to be vigilant so proverbs kind of leads me into that thought process that it will help us uh, to be sober-minded and to be uh, vigilant and to be stable and to lay a good foundation so thank you very much y'all for joining me today in this foundation of, of our study in Proverbs going through the introduction in the first lesson. I hope you've enjoyed it and there's going to be much more that we're going to add to this as we get into next week on the wise sayings but at this time I'd like for us to bow our heads and let us say a prayer if we will at this time. Father we thank you right now we we give you praise we give you honor we give you glory Lord for all of your word all of the Bible and all of its wisdom that's contained within the 66 books, we embrace it all. And God, at this time, this semester, as we embrace as a student body and, and our staff as well, embrace the, the wisdom of Proverbs. Lord, help us to walk in it. Help us, Lord, not to be a forgetful hearer of the word, but help us to be a doer of the word. We know that, that our life will be blessed, Lord, and that if we embrace wisdom, and that if we walk in the fear of the Lord, that it will be the beginning of knowledge for us. We don't want to be like the fool that despises wisdom and instruction. Help us take it to heart today and help us to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. And all of these things we ask, our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen and amen. God bless you. Join us the next time. Uh, look for the links on Moodle. And join us as we uh, travel through the book of Proverbs. God bless.